one of the founders of Flatiron School. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today uh, during your lunch break or whatever uh, to hear a little bit about our online web developer program. Um, and thank you everyone from Flatiron for uh, putting this together. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to get started. Yeah, go for it, Avi. <laughs> cool. So uh, as I said, I'm Avi. Um, I've been teaching at Flatiron School for just about uh, five years since we started, and it's been super fun. Um, and today I'm joined by Corinna, Tracy, and Avidor, who uh, all work with us on our online program. Um, and they're here, and they're going to tell you a little bit more about their roles and how they facilitate um, our students learning online. Um, so. Uh, I want to tell you guys a little bit about what we've changed about the program in the last year and a half since we launched it. Um, introduce you to the team, um, hear a little bit about what a day in the life of a Flatiron School student is online, and uh, then we're just going to really open this up to answer any questions you might have uh, for me, for Avidor, for Corinna, or for Tracy. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started. Uh, as I said, I'm Avi, and uh, yeah, I started this, I started, uh, I've been programming since I was like a little kid, like since I was like 11. Um, and uh, I started the school around five years ago after I left my last startup of designer pages um, because uh, I really wanted to share with people um, the skills that I gained kind of teaching myself through like trial by fire over the course of my life. I wanted to give people an easier way to gain access to these skills because I saw so many job opportunities and uh, programming was, meant so much to me in my life. Uh, and I was looking around at like CS programs and like you know being self-taught and just seemed way too hard. Um, so I met my co-founder Adam and we started the school and it's been pretty awesome. Um, I've gotten to like speak at Martha Stewart concert uh, conferences and hang out with Carly Kloss and Rebecca Minkoff and write patents and develop a lot of curriculum. It's been a pretty cool ride. Um, so we've been around since 2012. Uh, we've helped over well over a thousand students at this point um, learn how to code and get jobs as developers. Um, and we were one of the first, I mean, we were the first school to release an independently audited uh, outcome report because we really believe in transparency in education. Uh, I think we were one of the first schools, we were the first school, I think in probably history to ever offer like a job guarantee, um, which now is kind of like table stakes. So we've done a lot of flat iron school, we're really proud. And last year we launched um, something called learn.co, which was the educational platform we had developed in house that helps us run our classes and create quality control and things like that. Um, we were kind of so confident in the platform and the curriculum that we started allowing people that we have never met from all over the world um, start going through our curriculum, learning um, and mentoring them and coaching them and getting them jobs. And uh, the online program has basically been as successful for the graduates as the in-person program. So we're pretty proud of it and that's a lot thanks to Abidor and Corinna and Tracy and Emily and everyone who works at the school. Um, I get a lot of credit for this stuff, but the whole team is really like doing most of it. Um, so uh, as I was saying, it was like a, basically a year and a half since we launched Learn. And in that year and a half, we have learned a ton about how people learn, about what we can do better online. Um, and also just, you know, the nature of the job market is always changing. And, you know, in person, we really pride ourselves on being able to keep up with the demand of the market. Um, like I remember probably like three years ago when, uh, we had just finished our like Objective C and iOS curriculum, and Joe, the lead iOS instructor at the time, um, was giving like a talk about Objective C as people were watching the Apple keynote when they announced Swift. And like it took us like six months to rewrite our entire iOS curriculum in Swift. Um, so beyond just the curriculum stuff we've learned, um, that we kind of see change in the market, we've also been able to kind of formalize and structure the program better, um, if you believe it. When the online program started, it was basically just me and like 150 students learning together every day. And uh, we knew that was never kind of going to be sustainable. So we wanted to take kind of all the things that I was doing and then, you know, as Peter and Corinna and Avidor and Cernan and Luke and everyone started joining, we had actually an online instructional team. We really wanted to formalize the things that we saw working and kind of add structure to them and then uh, formally add them to the program instead of kind of like these ad hoc experiments. So the major updates that we've done in the last uh, few months to kind of modernize our online program, which is funny because it was already pretty modern, um, was one, uh, in the in-person uh, school, we've been, able, we've been adding things that we call a product series and a computer science series. Um, so the product series is really about teaching you kind of how products are developed beyond the technical aspects, but rather the workflows, what value statements are, things like that. And then computer science is really kind of the stuff you get in technical interviews. 
things like algorithms and data structures and just how to interview well. Um, so we've been uh, inviting a lot of people from the industry that we know in New York to start contributing curriculum, and uh, that's what they've been kind of formalizing as the product series, the computer science series. I think I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. And then um, we have now um, a team of like, I don't know, like five or six like full-time people that are basically responsible for the online uh, education. Um, and from Peter Bell, who's a former CTO and an amazing guy, to um, some of our favorite graduates like Karina. Karina actually is funny because I actually started teaching like six and a half years ago on something called Skillshare. And that's how like OG Karina is. She was literally one of my first students on Skillshare and then was in the first semester ever of Flatiron School. So um, it's, it's pretty awesome watching someone that I've like been working with for almost like six and a half years to join the team. Um, she's great. Um, and uh, so yeah, we, we have kind of a, an amazing team of online educational um, instructors and mentors um, that can really formalize the support that students need to succeed online. And then uh, we've increased the amount of lectures that we've had and really kind of spread it around time zones too, which we're really proud of. So I think at this point, there's something like 24 live instructional lectures a week. Um, those go from helping you plan your projects to, you know, doing Q and A's on like things that we see students are being stuck with. Actually, just lectures where we try to teach you a pattern or a technique. Um, so there's a ton of really formal structured educational support that we've been able to add to the program. Um, and then, as I was saying, our curriculum is really kind of something that we really take pride in. Um, I think at this point, the uh, full stack of the development track with the React is something like 873 discrete pieces of content, um, and those are what we call lessons. And of those 873 lessons, I think uh, we have type, some that are just readings that are kind of like chapters in a book. We have some videos that we've recorded. Um, sorry that my voice is like this, but you're going to have to hear a lot about it, <laughs> a lot from it. Um, and then we have labs. So it's a lot, a lot of curriculum. And we maintain that in kind of the same way that people maintain open source. So all of our curriculum is actually open sourced on GitHub, which allows everyone, uh, students, all the instructors at the school, not just the online ed team, um, and you know everyone in the world to basically contribute to it. So uh, we've had over 3,000 updates to our curriculum in the last year alone. And that's from fixing typos, to modernizing a lab, to taking out a lab that we don't like anymore. Um, and that's kind of what the heart of our school is, is really um, a passion for developing really lively and fun and educational curriculum that is effective. Um, so we kind of look at a lot of data about how people learn and what, what labs are hard and what labs are too easy and really tweak them a ton. Um, so we've added, you know, I mean, even when we launched the online program a year and a half ago, Angular was like the really cool JavaScript framework that everyone was talking about. And we kind of saw the market in the last year change and now React is really the adopted framework. So we kind of stripped out the Angular section and replaced it with an entirely new React and Redux section. Um, so our curriculum is constantly live, it's constantly being updated, um, and you basically can have access to it forever, uh, which is something that students don't really, uh, we never actually tell them. But once you join the program, you have access to the curriculum forever. Um, and when you graduate, in fact, we'll give you access. If you want to learn Angular, um, if you want to learn um, you know, iOS, we'll basically give you access to our entire library of curriculum. But while you're in the program, we like to keep you really focused in what's going to get you job ready as quickly as possible. And we think that's full stack web development with React. Um, I think we also added like a Node and Express section for more JavaScript. So I, I know that like eight months ago or so, we rewrote our entire JavaScript section to be like ES5 and ES6 compatible. Talk a little more about object orientation and kind of structural JavaScript. So that's kind of the that's kind of where our curriculum has been, how it's been evolving. Um, our curriculum, as I said, is not just videos um, and not just reading, but we have these really in-depth and fun labs that are that range from you know building one method to building a class to building an entire full-scale application like an Airbnb clone. Um, I think you build that more than once. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, but yeah, so you know we don't want you to just be watching and reading um, like a lot of other online education. Uh, but we want to really give you interactive labs. Um, so, in fact, like, you know, kind of, if you've used Learn before, you probably know what that means, but in a lot of other online education programs, when they do give you a project, they're basically like, download the zip and open it up, and here's a checklist of what you need to do. But rather than give you just kind of this, like, really static, non-interactive checklist, we give you a test suite. So we'll give you actually, uh, we'll write code that specifies how your application and how the lab is supposed to behave, and then it's your job as a student to make those tests pass. 
um, which is great because that pattern is something called test-driven development, and it's basically the best way to build software. So as you're actually solving labs, you're also learning really great patterns and workflow and writing tests and reading tests and understanding errors and things like that, so that you're constantly, you know, almost through osmosis, understanding what testing is, um, which makes our curriculum, you know, work on a lot of different levels, and there's a lot of like wax on, wax off moments um, that uh, we think, you know, make us, make our, our curriculum very different. Um, the other thing I think makes our curriculum really, really different, um, and again, it's hard to, you know, speak to people that, to, to like speak to beginners, but in programming, there's something called an abstraction. Um, so if you think about like a, a framework like Ruby on Rails, Ruby on Rails makes it really easy to build web applications using a programming language called Ruby. So it abstracts away or hides or encapsulates all the little things you need to do manually in order to build a web application, like talk to a database and write SQL statements and render HTML, and handle HTTP requests and responses. The Rails framework abstracts all that away so that you don't have to do it. Um, so in a lot of other schools, they'll just teach you something like React or Node or Express or Ruby on Rails, but they'll never teach you how those things work. So you'll know how to use the framework but you won't know how the framework was built. Because the framework is such an abstraction and does everything for you, you never really understand the patterns that allow those kinds of abstractions to be built. Our curriculum is a kind of a path upward towards abstraction. So we're constantly making you, in order to teach you programming, we want you to be building the little components that make up these frameworks like React and Express and jQuery and Ruby on Rails. That way you're understanding not just how to use those frameworks, but how those frameworks actually work and were built. Um, because we think that that is the best way to learn. Um, so that there you begin again all these like little building blocks that kind of snap and click together into these larger concepts. Um, and by the time you end up learning Rails, by the time you end up learning React, you've actually built most of the concepts and core components of those frameworks. Um, so instead of having to kind of you know approach the kitchen sink that is Ruby on Rails. Um, we give you each little part first, um, and uh, that kind of, we think that that is one better way to teach and uh, a lot more fun for you because you get to kind of see these things naturally come together. So that's our curriculum. Um, and then in terms of the computer science stuff that we've added, um, again, this is, you know, um, as someone who does not have a formal computer science training um, but has a software patent, uh, I think that computer science covers like a wide spectrum of topics. Um, what we really wanted to focus on are the things that we think are going to get you, uh, are going to make the job process easiest for you. Um, so that's things like algorithms, um, things like, you know, what is big O, uh, what are the common sort algorithms, what are, you know, breadth first search and depth first search, how do you parse different kinds of um, data structures in an efficient manner. Um, and again, those are the kinds of things that uh, are mostly useful for uh, for interview purposes, but are also really fun because we're all a bunch of geeky nerds, and those are some of the classical problems in computer science and discovering how they were solved um, and understanding kind of the, the beauty of those algorithms we think is pretty fun. And then there's something called a data structure, which again is kind of like a loaded term. Uh, a data structure is basically just a way of storing data. So um, if you think about like a string or a bunch of letters coming together to form a word, that's an example of a data structure. But then there are common ones like arrays and hashes um, but then there are even kind of ways to use arrays and hashes that are more com complex um, and, are, and we kind of call, the, call those a formal data structure. So we go over things like matrices and nested arrays and nested hashes, um, a lot, a lot of different graphs and binary search nodes and trees and things like that. Um, so that you're familiar with them, so that you can know how best to structure data that you might be getting in an interview challenge, even in a real life project. Um, and all this is really for uh, trying to make you less intimidated and more capable during your technical interviews. Um, so we give you a mock technical interview, we give you a lot of tips on how we've seen people succeed or fail, what to do when you don't know an answer in a technical interview, which by the way happens to me. Like five years ago when we were starting the school, uh, me and Adam were going around and interviewing a bunch of CTOs in New York to kind of get a sense of what they were looking for in junior developers. So that as we were developing the curriculum, we would know that um, we were teaching people the right things for a job. And I remember I was being interviewed, like I would pretend uh, that I will, like I basically applied a job with like a fake resume and I'd get an interview, that way I'd be able to kind of see how they interview people without like, you know, having them try and impress me or Adam or anything like that. I remember I was being interviewed once and like they were asking me a question, like how would you scale this website to, you know, a website that works well in America to Asia? And I was like 
rattling off answers and they just kept on saying no, that doesn't work, that didn't work, what else will you try? And eventually I was like, look, I don't know. <laughs> and so it does happen. Um, but yeah, that's why we want to give you a lot of technical interview training. Um, so that's kind of the computer science section that we've added to the curriculum. And then the next section we added is a product series section. Um, and we did this for two reasons. One, because ultimately we believe that the point of software is to create value, to change the world, to create meaning in people's lives. And just knowing the mechanics of how to program, um, it's kind of like knowing, you know, how to like, uh, you know, like, I don't know, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good metaphor, but I'm lost. But it's like knowing the, the parts of, of, of like, like how to play the guitar, but not know how to play in a band. Um, or know, knowing how to read music or knowing what chords are, but not knowing how to like compose a song. So the product series we added really because we want our programmers to be awesome. We want you guys to build, you know, amazing and beautiful things. Um, and just understanding a little about product thinking and design thinking, we thought was really crucial to uh, making our developers um, meaningful. And then um, the more that we talk to employers, the more we realize that this is what really um, doesn't necessarily get you hired, but this is what makes you amazing at your job. Because we've heard from a lot of alumni that those first weeks are really scary, they feel like imposters, but if they can bring not just their technical competency, but a sense of product thinking to their teams, they immediately stand out from the rest of them. Um, so we added those product surveys and cover topics like finding product market fit, what that even means, um, common user experience and design patterns that you generally have to implement as a program with understanding why those patterns exist, the fundamentals of online businesses from SaaS, and from SaaS to marketing, things like that, and then just workflows, things like Agile, test-driven development, Trello, Jira, um, Pivotal Tracker, um, you know, Red, Green, Refactor, just the common workflows that large-scale teams and even small-scale teams um, use uh, to build the product. And as I said, like the way we've kind of compiled a lot of this content with computer science and the product series is really by going to the companies that have hired you know, eight to 12 developers from our school and inviting their you know, head of products, their CTOs, in to basically give lectures and create content around these topics. Um, so we've had people from BuzzFeed and Gilt and Venmo and Bounce Exchange and a lot of really great companies um, speak at the school. We've recorded those lectures, we've augmented them with some written content, um, and that's what makes up the computer science and the product series. And, you know, we're pretty excited about that. Um, so I want to tell you a little about uh, how people learn at Flatiron School. Um, so we think of it as a kind of a full stack journey. Um, so we think that starting to learn, when you're starting to learn how to program, we think Ruby is a great language. It's really pure. It can, you can really focus on the fundamentals like object orientation, variable scope, and things like that. Um, then you go into SQL, which is a really important language. No one talks about it anymore. But it's basically how we talk to databases. And then we kind of move you through the web stack all the way to Rails. And then the rest of the time, you're just in JavaScript land. And you're going to learn really great JavaScript testing from Mocha and Jasmine. You're going to learn React and Redux, um, Node and Express, um, and you know, be a full stack web developer. And then, as I said, after you graduate, we even have other curriculum that you can uh, peruse and, and learn. Uh, when you're learning on Learn, we want you to use a real uh, developer environment. So we have something called a Learn IDE. Um, it used to be that when you wanted to learn how to program, you either could use basic REPL, like on Code Academy, and type in little snippets of code. But we think that's a little too contrived. Um, so then you have to set up your own environment, but as a beginner, setting up your own environment is such a hassle, and you just want to write code, and we kind of thought that incidental complexity was a little too much. So we built something called uh, a Learn IDE that basically comes with a remote programming environment. So you get to use the same tool that actually, you know, the IDE that we built it off of is called Atom, which is developed at GitHub. Um, that way you have a real programming environment with a terminal, um, a Ruby compiler, a, a JavaScript compiler, real text editor and file tree so you can you know, build apps for Node and Express and Rails to little Ruby projects. Um, on Learn, there's an integrated Q&A feature so that whenever you want to ask a question, you just hit ask a question. And we have a team of uh, people around the world that are there to answer your questions. Um, there are study groups with other students, there are lectures, there are office hours, there are project helps. Um, there's a ton of different kinds of instructional formats that are live in real time um, and there are video chats that we found really helpful. Um, we love to pair students up, so we have a bunch of different bots and features on Learn that will help you find other students to talk to and work with. Um, and then you're gonna get code reviews. Um, so every kind of major section ends with a project and then a portfolio project. And you'll be going over those with your instructors. 
Um, and then uh, I guess uh, kind of one thing we wanted to do as we're all programmers here is uh, give you uh, the one biggest piece of advice for new students. Um, and after having mentored and taught, you know, a thousand students, um, I think actually the best thing you can do as a beginner is really think about how you learn um, and think about what works for you. And every day, kind of the end of the day or your beginning of the day, you should actually reflect on your process. How was Googling? What could you do better? Did you try reading a book? Did you try watching the video again? Did you read the error messages? But if you keep on trying the same thing and you're not making progress, you have to change something. Um, that means that you have to reflect on what you're doing because that's the only way to change it. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce our educational team. Um, and we're going to start with our section leads and then our program mentors and our technical coaches. So I'm going to turn this over to Avi Lord, who's going to take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. I think we're going to be a little out of order from section leads, program mentors, and technical coaches. Um, so my name is Avador, and I manage the technical coaches on Learn. So if you've been on Learn and you've checked it out and use that ask a question, uh, someone hops in to help you out, those are the technical coaches. Um, so let me just start off a little bit by uh, telling you who I am. So as I said, uh, my name is Avador, and I'm actually a graduate of the in-person program here. Uh, I did it from September to December in 2015. Uh, and before this, probably like many of you, I had uh, a different job and a different career. And I found myself kind of like after work and days off, always interested in like trying to learn how to program, doing little bits and pieces here and there, but never really bringing everything all together. Uh, and then after a few years, I decided, you know, like I want to give this a try. I want to try and make a change. Uh, so I came here to Flatiron School. Uh, learned as much as I could, and when I finished up, I came on as a section lead for about six months, and now I'm managing the technical coaches. So that's who I am and how I got here. Uh, and now to tell you a little bit uh, about the technical coaches. So they are the ones behind that ask a question button, and they provide immediate support to students. So if you sign up and join our program, they're there. They're actually still there, even if you're on the free track, trying out the, um, the bootcamp prep course, into the JavaScript, uh, so they're in there. So if you're, they help out with all sorts of things. If you get stuck on a programming question, if you're having some issues with the IDE, uh, they're there to help you out. Um, and what their goal is, is they're trying to teach you um, like the material without just giving you the answer. Because I mean, a lot of times when you're stuck, sometimes you really just want to know, like, how do I, like, what, what am I supposed to be doing? Um, but if you just get the answer, it doesn't necessarily help you moving forward. Uh, it can, I'm sure you can gain some information about that, but they try and do as much as they can, like a, a Socratic method of teaching. So they'll be asking you like, oh, you know, you have this error message, do you know what it means? Uh, to try and explain maybe how to read an error message if, if it's something you've never realized before. That way, next time you see error messages, you have things you can do like Google them, or maybe it's when you've seen before and now you know what the symptoms are, Maybe you didn't realize the error message shows you exactly where in the code something's broken. Uh, so as much as they can, they try and help you out with this. Uh, and the way they do that is they'll have someone who kind of just does like a quick like assessment of the question, and then if you need a little bit more help, they'll actually provide one-on-one like -on -one support where they'll do a screen share so they can see your screen and help like talk you through it. Uh, so so with that, I'll move over to my one bit of advice, and that's don't be afraid to break things. Um, so when you start on learning, or really anywhere you try and code, there's no way you're going to get it right the first time. Uh, especially on learning when you download a lab and you run the test, everything is broken, and that's totally okay. Uh, as Avi mentioned previously, we're doing test-driven development, so we're going to start off with everything breaking. Uh, but that being said, like when you're working on something, if you have things working pretty well, as long as you save your code and use Git, you can go in there, change things, and break as much as you want. You'll start getting a whole bunch of new error messages, and you can start learning like, oh, when I change this, that broke everything. Uh, and it's a great way to try and kind of like learn about a language uh, like Ruby or JavaScript. Uh, and the other great thing is, if you're using uh, Git, you can always rewind. So that's one thing that's made me feel really great about programming is I, I break a lot of things. Uh, and if I've broken it quite badly, I'll just rewind. Uh, so that's my bit of advice. And I'll move forward and pass it off 
to Tracy. Hi. So I am Tracy. I am one of the program mentors here at Flatiron. And let me tell you about my previous life and how it kind of meshed into my current life. Um, I actually started learning how to program about 15 years ago. Um, I started with C++, um, which I loved the lab and hated the theory. Um, and then I moved on to VB.net um, at a time when my school was still trying to force Pascal and Fortran on us. Um, that being said, I decided, oh, I don't need to graduate with a dual degree because I hate SQL. I'll get back to that later. Um, but I decided I would wait to get my certifications and somewhere around 2010, I decided to move into tech support and sys uh, systems administration. So I've done that for um, the government. I've done that for Microsoft in a roundabout way. And then life happened. And so I started uh, moving more into a, a role that's more like onboarding customers um, and project management and did that for about two years. And then in the process, found out about women who code. Um, and that was my introduction to coding. Um, my current area um, loves Python. And I tried that at first, didn't work out so well, um, and fell in love with Ruby. So that's where I'm at. Um, I also. All of those schools are Salvador was a and other students, we are really a tight-knit community, and I think that's what I love most about Flatiron. So on the next slide, let's talk about my piece of advice. But instead of advice, I'm going to give you a mantra, and I wholeheartedly believe this, and I say this, I am a coder. I am learning to code. Every day is a stupid day. It's the nature of the beast, but I am not alone. If and when you start this program, you will feel stupid. It's just because you're learning something new. But remember, there are no stupid questions. It's the way that you approach them. And the more that you get used to learning about coding, you'll realize that it'll help you apply like your decisions and solutions to the way that you approach life. So that's me. I will now give you to one of our instructor slash section leads, Karina. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm Krina. Avi told you a little bit about me at the beginning. Um, but yeah, so I have been at Flatiron and with learning from Avi for a really long time. Um, I started in, so I'm based in New York City. 
uh, no, I'm not based in New York City. I'm based in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I moved to New York City um, first for about five weeks for one of Avi's Skillshare classes. And he just kind of walked up to me at a meetup one day and he's like, hey, I'm doing this thing called Flatiron School. You should totally come. I was like, you're insane. I just moved like a thousand miles away. Um, but he he convinced me despite being a um, New York football fan and a, a Patriots fan from way back uh, that I should come and learn from him. And it was honestly the best thing that I ever did. I was um, a student in the first immersive class in Flatiron ever. Um, it's evolved a lot. Uh, after I left Flatiron, I ended up um, having a job, not in Rails, but in PHP, because in Knoxville, Tennessee, there was, like Tracy said, where she's in, in Texas, there's a lot of Python. In Knoxville, there wasn't any Ruby on Rails at all. There was one consult consulting shop that said that they possibly would do Ruby on Rails if a client asked for it, but they didn't at all yet. Um, and one of the really cool things that I learned about Flatiron was that it really prepared me for making a switch like that. Once you learn the way that we teach the languages, once you learn sort of the theory behind things and the general language patterns, you can pick up the syntax and how things work really, really easily. And that makes me a really strong believer in the way that we teach code at Flatiron, even though it feels like, okay, I just want to kind of get through this and, um, you know, can I just make a website already the way that some programs do? You're really going to love um, having all of that background and knowledge once you actually get out into the real world. Um, before I came to Flatiron School, I did a bunch of different things. I ran a bookstore for a while. Um, you can tell I love books. Um, and I was an executive assistant for about 10 years. So I really wasn't doing anything technical at all. Um, I, moved, I was in Boston, which explains the Patriots thing. Um, but I was in Boston for a while and then moved to Knoxville. And I worked for the University of Tennessee. And you could take a free developing class. And everybody, like my whole life, has been saying, oh, you're really good with computers. You should be a developer. And I'm like, you're insane. I'm not doing that. Um, and so you could take a free, uh, you could take free classes at University of Tennessee. And I was like, all right, fine. I thought at the time that I was going to go back to school and maybe be a nurse. Um, but I thought, okay, fine. I'm just going to take a development class. And I fell in love. It was in C++, like Tracy's. Um, and it was just, it worked in my brain. It was logical and it was cool. And I could actually like create stuff. Being a developer is really cool because it's one of the, um, a few careers that exist anymore, you, you actually change what exists in the world on a daily basis. And I just find that so amazing. Um, so I had a job for a few years after I graduated from Flatiron School. And about a year ago, I came back to be an instructor, uh, a section lead now. Sorry, we just changed the terminology. So, um, so I apologize if it's a little confusing. So instructors and section leads are the same thing. Um, I'm the instructor for the very first part of the section, so I'm the one that you get to work with when, or have to work with, depending on how you look at it, uh, when you first start our program from the very beginning all the way up through your first uh, portfolio project. And um, we have two other section leads that work with us, Cernan and Luke. They're both graduates of our LEARN program, so they know it in and out. They're wonderful in, um, in terms of just knowing the program backwards and forwards and really being able to help students effectively. We teach much like the technical coaches with the Socratic method. And so you're never going to have a session with one of us where we're just like, oh, here's the answer, go away. We're always going to try and help walk you to your solutions so that way you actually kind of understand the logic behind it and you'll actually be able to apply whatever that concept is to everything that you're doing in the future. Um, we have five major sections in the course. Uh, some of the things that you're going to do with section leads, we um, provide technical assistance to all the students. Um, we do Slack, we do one-on-ones, um, and we're, we're really here to be your tech resource for the section that you're in. We also um, assist with building your portfolio projects, which are the projects that you do at the end of every major section. We have five major sections in the course. Um, we also develop and lead daily groups, um, and we're assisted in that in the teaching of those daily groups by our TAs that we've just hired. Um, so we try to have a really good range of times and availability for groups for you guys. And we also perform project reviews. So at the end of every one of those five major sections, we have what we call a portfolio project review. And so that's a project that you built individually 
that you sit down with the with an instructor and we ask you some questions about it we go over the code we really make sure that you understand what you're doing before you move on to the next section so we can kind of help you if you have them identify those holes in the knowledge and help get you through them so that you have a really strong foundation going into your next section um, in our next slide, we'll actually look at our sample schedule that we have for the day. As you can see, we try and have a broad range of times and uh, different groups that you can attend. Um, we also have the ability to have student-led groups, but these ones that I'm particularly talking about are the instructor-led groups. So we have four different kinds of groups on our schedule. Um, the first kind is an accountability check-in, and those are generally led by um, an instructor. I think we have one that we've asked a student to lead because he's really amazing, very dynamic. Um, and just absolutely loves being part of our community. Um, and those are just sort of a weekly check-in to pop in. Um, you're welcome to attend any of them. And they are just sort of a place where you can talk about what you did last week, what you do this, what you're planning on doing this week, goals that you have, um, things that were challenging, just kind of life events if you want to share that much information. Any of the things that can either help you do better or the things that are in the way. And so in those community groups, we really try to help each other, just support each other and understand, like Tracy said, that you are just not alone. And I know a lot of times people are really worried about being in an online community and feeling like you are alone. And so we do everything that we can to make sure that you don't feel like that. So we have three other different kinds of groups through a little bit more technical focus. We have live lectures, we have portfolio project um, prep groups, and we have office hours. Live lectures are talk topic based and um, they are uh, either instructors or um, are sort of have a topic that they're teaching on and it'll be more interactive than most live lectures so we'll kind of ask for input from the audience um last night Cernan one of our instructors talk, uh had a group called uh flat wars and so it uses our the code wars platform and they give you a, a problem and you work in teams to try and solve it and so in that way, we try to reinforce the concepts that you're learning. And that goes across like all levels. You can come if you're in the final section, you can come if you just started. And we try to create groups and partnerships and it just helps you to kind of have more contacts in the program. Um, but let's see where, oh, office hours are um, question-based. So you will hold an open, open office hours section and you can come bring your questions, you can bring topic questions, you can bring program questions, you can bring um, uh, subject questions. You can really ask any question that you would like to in the instructor office hours as long as they're sort of relevant to the topic, the um, section that the instructor teaches and we'll answer it. Sometimes they're short, sometimes they're really long. Um, it just depends on the questions that people have for the day. Uh, we'll go over labs if you're struggling with them, we'll kind of help step you through um, the things that you're struggling with and um, help sort of decipher testing, really anything that you need help with in office hours is on the table. Um, and portfolio project prep groups um, are for two purposes. We'll help you kind of plan out and develop your portfolio project that you're working on. And if you're having uh, trouble specifically with your with building your portfolio project, then um, as well, we'll help you kind of troubleshoot those error messages that you're getting. So we hope, um, like Avi said, we have 24 plus uh, study groups, lectures, labs, check-ins um, through a whole wide variety of time. Um, we try to have eight sort of after the general nine to five hours and eight every weekend. So that way there, if you are working a full-time job, you have a lot of availability as well. It's not just for the students that can be around nine to five. And, um, with that, we'll go to my uh, biggest piece of advice. And for me, the thing that I found more than anything else was that this is going to be challenging. You're literally teaching yourself a new way to think, but it it could not be more worth it. It completely changed my life. I, I don't think I would be the person that I am today if I hadn't learned how to be a developer. Um, when you hit that point, everybody hits the wall. When you hit it, keep going. It, that wall means that you're going to have a breakthrough and you're just going to be amazed when you look at yourself when you start to be learn how to be a developer you just kind of it's important to kind of look back at yourself a month ago and think wow i have no idea that a month ago i would be doing this right now 
Um, and so I think as developers and as just generally humans, we get really hard on ourselves a lot. And that's something to just kind of keep in mind is, you know, it's, it's going to be challenging, but it could not be more worth it. Cool. Um, and with that, I think I am actually going to pass it back to Miss Emily, who's going to give us some ideas about logistics. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, sorry, I just had an echo there. Awesome. So we're going to just uh, talk a little bit about logistics, how to get started. I um, know from the questions that some of you are already working through our free courses. Some of you are actually already even enrolled, which is awesome, too. Um, but if you are in our free courses, uh, here's how to get started um, with the full online web developer program. So um, really all you need to do is submit your application. Um, we've gotten some good questions about, um, you know, if I'm working through a free course, do I need to finish the free course before I apply? The answer is no. Um, what we're really looking for is that you've given yourself the opportunity to um, try coding, try coding on our platform, um, figure out if coding is something that you like doing and something that you can see yourself doing full time for your job. Um, and if you've gotten to that point and you decided, wow, I really, really want to code um, for my career, then we absolutely want to read your application. Um, so what you can do is head to our online web developer page, um, which we'll link out to in the follow up email. Um, you can apply right there on that page. And then from there, you can look out for an email from our admissions team um, to schedule a time. Um, so we wish you all the best of luck for that process. Um, we actually have um, some people from our admissions team on the webinar right now. So I'll definitely be putting any specific admissions questions to them. So feel free to submit those as well. Um, so without uh, further ado, we'll sort of jump into the Q&A period with a um, final thought, a first question. Um, so I guess I will put this to Abador first since he's sitting here right next to me. Um, what is something that you wish you knew before you learned how to code? It's a great question. Um, something I wish I knew before I learned how to I guess I probably, I guess I probably wish I knew just how important Googling was uh, for what I was working on and how important error messages were. Uh, I know when I first started coding, it was, I mean, I know a lot of times when I would get error messages popping up on my computer, it would just be like, yes, press OK, because there's just a whole bunch of nonsense in that box that I didn't want to read. Uh, so when I was programming, I started getting error messages, it kind of felt similar, like, oh, something's wrong for sure. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of nonsense in here. Uh, but I, I guess as soon as I've learned, like, that's really important information, and it gives me a lot of great information on stuff I can Google, it points me to where the error is. Um, I, I found that to be very helpful. Great. Um, uh, Tracy, do you want to jump in with uh, something that you wish you knew before learning to code? To to jump on top of the Google train, like I always like to tell people I have Google Foo. It's the one thing that you should like spend some time on because those errors, Google isn't as hard as most people think. If you think you have a stupid sentence that's grammatically incorrect, 50,000 other people have. So paste that exact error in. But the other thing I wished I'd known before learning to, to code was don't try to learn all of the things simultaneously. Um, it, it serves to jumble up the brain. And it took me about three months to decide, oh, I just want to stick with Ruby because I was trying to learn Ruby, data science, and Python all at the same time, and nothing was sticking. So if you find something that you want to try, you might get frustrated. But if you kind of have an affinity to it, just keep sticking to it so you can at least grasp, grasp some of the foundations before you move on to something else. Awesome. Uh, Corinna, how about you? Um, for me, I think that I, um, I wish I knew how important the details were. Uh, it's, it's very easy to, in your day-to-day -day life, um, kind of ignore things like semicolons and parentheses that you kind of miss, like typos are major and autocorrect is a thing for a reason. Um, when you are a developer, precision is 
absolutely key. Um, and the kind of the sooner you realize that and just pay attention to all those tiny details, the easier your life is going to be. Um, back to awesome. you, Emily. Sorry, you cut out a little bit there. Um, great. So we will just um, jump right on in to the questions from the audience, of which there are many. You guys are great at asking thoughtful and helpful questions. Um, so let's sort of just jump in. We have a couple of questions for our admissions team, actually. So I think, um, Tyler, are you there on the line? You can unmute yourself. I'm here. Hi, Tyler. Hello. Um, Great. So the first question is, um, can you share what the major differences between the online program and, and the in-person program are? Yes, that is a very good question. I think the main difference, Avi, of course, talked about the curriculum and the things you learn. The main difference really comes down to the scheduling and the flexibility and the pace of the course. So the online program is entirely self-paced. So you put in the hours that are going to be most convenient for you. The in-person program here is full time for 15 weeks. So it really comes down to just the scheduling and, and how you structure your time while in the course. Otherwise, the curriculum and the resources you get from our team of section leads and technical coaches is very similar to what you'd see in an in-person program. Great, that's a great answer. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so another question for you while you're unmuted. Um, we have a lot of people who, I mean, I guess I already spoke to this, but I think that you could probably shed some additional light. We have people who are working through the free courses and they're really wanting to um, finish the free courses before they apply. Can you share um, what your perspective is on when someone should know when they're ready to apply? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. I think if you've gone through some of the free courses and you've kind of discovered that this is something you're passionate about, there's nothing stopping you from applying right away. I think if you have demonstrated to yourself that you're really invested in, in learning programming and see this as a potential career opportunity, I'd recommend applying as soon as you hit that point. You do not need to complete any of the free courses prior to applying. It really just comes down to you realizing whether or not this is something that you could see yourself doing and if, if this is the right thing for you. So I think if you have at least a little bit of experience in the free courses, my advice would be to apply if this seems like the right next step. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. Um, you got it. So, uh, Tracy, why don't we... ...for um, for online student. Um, have we had grads who have been working full-time jobs while they're um, going through um, our online program? Can you be successful? I am a full-time employee with part-time school and I feel pretty darn successful. Um, but no, seriously, I have those students that are working full-time jobs, have two and three hour commutes. I actually spoke to two of them this week. And I think we do set you up for success because, okay, now we have study groups that are later in the night. We have study groups that are on the weekend. So you're not missing as much instruction as if it was just specifically eight to five. Um, the key thing is to not try to do too much at once. And I know that sounds like something I said earlier, but in this instance, specifically, you get really enthusiastic and you start the program and you wanna do everything and you spend all of your time. It's great that you're enthusiastic, but at the same time, you don't wanna remember that, you don't wanna forget that you do still have a life outside of school. So pacing just comes to just planning. Okay, I have this number of things to do this week, I'll write it out. I still handwrite notes. I have a couple of moleskins that I use and I plan things out for the week and I say, okay, this is my goal for the week. And if you set reasonable goals, then no matter if you're a 70 or 60 hour a week student or a 10 or a 20 hour a week student, you'll still succeed. Totally. I think that's really helpful. Um, any, if there are any follow up questions, feel free to pop them in audience. Uh, so moving on, um, we have just a ton of questions coming in. Um, so, Avi, why don't we ask you um, a really good question. Um, uh, so, if teamwork and collaboration and um, pair, programming, pair programming is emphasized, um, this person is wondering, can an online pro program actually prepare someone for um, working on a team in real life? 
Um, so I guess the first thing to realize is that um, there's a lot of software that's written by people that have never met each other. Um, so the open source workflow of forking labs, of cloning them, submitting pull requests, the same way that you learn on learn, is actually how distributed teams around the world um, contribute to open source and build things like Ruby on Rails and Express and React and uh, Angular. Um, so just being able to understand that tooling and that tool set about how to kind of work on distributed code is super important. Um, and then, you know, we live in a, an amazing age uh, that has unbelievable tools like Zoom and Hangouts and Screen Hero. Um, and there's so many great pairing options. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty easy to build software with someone that you've never met necessarily in person. Um, and I think just understanding how to collaborate, in fact, the more distributed, the harder you have to work to learn how to work with someone else. Um, so if you can learn to work with someone that you've never met online and you guys are both beginners and you're learning together, you're going to be a great team member when it's way easier when you're in person. Um, so that's kind of, you know, between Slack and GitHub and the tool set that we give you on Learn, um, we think that we're kind of really priming you, preparing you for what it's actually like to be a real developer working on teams. Totally. Thank you, Avi. Um, just checking out more questions here. Um, Alvaro, why don't we throw a question to you? Um, so we got a question from somebody who's either in the Community Power Boot Camp program or thinking about it. What kind of support um, is provided for that group of learners? So for the Community Powered Boot Camp program, um, the technical coaches aren't supporting that. But the Ask the Question feature is still there uh, and it's community driven. So there's other students in there helping each other out, and there's a Slack community. So even if someone isn't necessarily watching all the questions that come in through the Ask a Question button, uh, students are usually talking with each other and chatting uh, using Slack. Kind of, you know, if you have a question or if you want to look for someone to pair with you on something. Uh, and I think the Community Power Bootcamp also still has access to um, all of the video lectures that have been pre-recorded. Um, so that one of the differences between the Community Power Bootcamp and the kind of full staff program uh, with full support. Awesome. Thank you, Amador. Um, so let's throw some questions to Corinna. Um, some, some questions about um, the course and the structure. Um, so Corinna, can you share what the five uh, major sections of the course are? Sure. Um, so the first section goes through um, an intro to Ruby section, which is similar to um, actually share some of the content with our um, free intro to Ruby uh, section. And it goes through Git and GitHub, HTML and CSS, uh, procedural Ruby, and then object oriented Ruby. And your first final project section comes at the end of our um, uh, object oriented Ruby section. And then the, our next section is SQL and Sinatra. And the third is Rails. The fourth is JavaScript and jQuery. And our fifth one is um, React and Redux. Awesome. Great. Thanks for that synopsis. Um, so, following up on that, another sort of curriculum related question um, Do grads have access to the curriculum afterwards? And is there anything additional that they're provided after they graduate? Absolutely. You actually, once you graduate from Learn, you have access to Learn for the rest of your life, um, which is kind of fun. Um, so there's uh, right now. I know that there's um, Node.js. We did um, switch out React for Angular, but you can have access if you want to the Angular stuff after graduation. Um, it is not actually. Um, we're not keeping it up, but it's still there since we found that the vast majority of employers are looking for Angular. Um, excuse me, are looking for React graduates now. Um, let's see, I think, I know there's probably a couple others that I'm forgetting, but. So, so there's a whole lot of stuff, a lot of curriculum. Yeah. Maybe that's up there as well. Awesome, yep. thank you. Amador and Corinna. Um, Corinna, before you unmute yourself, um, do you have a sense of how many online grads there have been so far since you've been um, with us for a while now? Yeah, um, so we currently have about 600 oh. students uh, who are in the program, and we've graduated um, about 140 or 50 right now. The number keeps going up, so it's hard to uh, give you guys like an exact, exact number. Um, but uh, yeah, so we have, we just released our, uh, as Avi said, we just released the, our very first independent audit, the 
independently audited jobs report for um, our online learn.co uh, community specifically. And we had 97% of our and 100% um, of those graduates accepted software engineering jobs. So everybody who graduated and um, completed our career commitment got a job in, in software engineering. Awesome, yeah, those are great pieces of information to, to share. Um, and yeah, I think we'll be releasing even more jobs data um, in the coming months, so keep an eye out, yeah. everyone. Um, speaking of the curriculum, though, Avi, I have a question for you. Um, so you mentioned that the curriculum is um, available on GitHub. Where can someone find that? Uh, sure. Uh, if you go to github.com slash learn dash co dash curriculum, okay. you'll find our curriculum organization. Um, and we've open sourced the majority of our curriculum that we've deployed. The problem you're going to run into is that there's, they're not in any particular order on GitHub. Um, so you can kind of like try to search for a particular lab or a particular lesson, um, and I would say just use Google for that. Um, there's probably better tutorials than our curriculum alone. We really think our curriculum works best with the instructional support, with the learn platform, with all the tooling and integration, um, and of course, the, just the, the flow of it. Um, so that uh, what learn.co really does is kind of sit on top of GitHub as a database and organize the curriculum according to the, the order that we think is uh, best. Um, so while we want our curriculum to be open source, that way programmers and students all around the world can help contribute to it, it doesn't quite stand alone if you just access it on GitHub. But, um, you know, if you are ambitious and want to try that, more power to you. Awesome. Can you repeat that link for us? It is github.com slash learn dash co co dash curriculum. That is our curriculum organization, and you will find thousands and thousands of repositories there of what our curriculum is, which is actually really nice because while, again, I think it would be impossible to teach yourself how to code from just our free curriculum, especially in that format, you can see what our curriculum is like and read the readings and get a sense of what the test-driven test labs are like um, and really see that the plethora and, and just breadth of the curriculum, the depth that we have, is really what differentiates us. Totally. Um, and while we're at it, um, do our in-person students use Learn as well? Yeah, um, in fact, we didn't originally develop Learn uh, to do an online program like this. Um, we developed Learn just to maintain quality in our in-person program. Um, so kind of, you know, we had a bunch of different campuses, and I was an instructor in one, and there were instructors in our other campus in Brooklyn, and we were both end up, we were kind of writing the same labs, and we wanted to centralize the way that we kept our curriculum, and we wanted to centralize the way we deployed it and gave it to students and track their progress. So Learn was very much born out of the in-person program. Um, the way we look at it now is that the in-person program is kind of like our research lab. We get to experiment with curriculum, we can move a little faster because people are in person, they're here all day, and every time we find something that works really well in person, then we bring it online. So that's how kind of the computer science and the product series we just added the curriculum. We've been kind of um, experimenting with that and developing it in the past for the last six months with our in-person students and just recently have been able to kind of to solidify it and actually move it online. Awesome. Thanks, Avi. Um, well, we only have just a couple minutes left. Um, so, Tyler, I think I want to throw it back to you really quickly. Somebody's asking about our job guarantee. Can you share just some quick details around that in the next minute and a half? <laughs> Got it. Yeah, so our online program does have a job guarantee. We essentially guarantee that if you go through the course and graduate and stick to what we've discovered are the most successful job search tactics, we guarantee you'll find work within 180 days of graduation or you get a full refund on the tuition that you've paid. We purposefully don't mention the job placement support or career services until you're about 75% through the course. We want you to really focus on learning and programming while you're a student at Flatiron. Once you're nearing program completion, you'll start working with our career services team and a designated career coach to prepare you for the search and, and help you navigate the search to find an opportunity or opportunities that you really will enjoy and, and thrive in. Great, thanks so much, Tyler. Um, so from here, we'll uh, wrap it up. Uh, we have not had nearly anywhere enough time to answer all of your awesome questions. So I urge you to tweet at us. We're at Flatiron School, send us your questions. 
can also email success at flatironschool.com if you want to start a, a more lengthy uh, conversation with more than 140 characters. We would love to hear all your questions. Um, and if you are currently working through our one of our free courses, you might qualify for our Commit to Code scholarship. So we're actually offering 100 scholarships over the course of the summer to people who have demonstrated a passion for code, have demonstrated that they are willing to um, spend the time and dedicate them. a $1,500 scholarship. All right, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Uh, we can't wait to hear the, um, all of your awesome questions again offline um, and hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much. Bye.